Hi, everybody. We're here to talk about Trinidad and Tobago, but we're not going to focus too much on the economy in the strict economic sense that I would normally um, discuss. Uh, so an, I'm going to go a little bit outside of my comfort zone today. And to help me with that, I have two rock stars and two gentlemen I feel very honored and privileged to call friends. Um, first, we have Peter George Jr., who, as you may know, is an entrepreneur, an accomplished member of the business community here in Trinidad and Tobago, but also throughout the region in the Caribbean. And he's also a public commentator on matters um, occurring in Trinidad and Tobago. I have John Estrada as well, who in the 244 year history of the US Marine Corps is the, was sorry, the 15th Sergeant Major. Um, he was also at one point the US Ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago. He is from Trinidad and Tobago and spends time in Trinidad and Tobago still based on the fact that he still got, has a lot of friends and family there. So welcome guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you okay, so we're gonna talk a lot about the problems that we have in Trinidad and Tobago without focusing too much on the economy. Um, and we also will spend more time talking about the solutions. So first I want to hand over to Peter to tell us, in your view, what are the challenges we face? How did we get here um, in terms of ease of doing business challenges, the, pol the politics, uh, and what, what is your sense of why we, why we are where we are in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, if I was to talk about the issues that we have, we need a lot more than this show. So let's let's uh, let's start first, Mother, with how we got here. And yes. I think one of the issues that is so often overlooked um, in any of the national discussions that we have and the dialogue that we have um, is is the historical context as to where Trinidad is today and mm -hmm. how we got to where we are today. Because you have to look at your past to try and understand mm -hmm. why you are where you are now. And it's something that Absolutely. we never do. Um, you know, as, as Trinidadians, we keep getting caught up in, in I guess it's, it's, it's part of what's happening throughout the world in, you know, in dealing with the issues that are facing us now. But if we mm -hmm. look back, if we look back, and as many people have surmised that the darkest day for Trinidad was August 31st, 1962. Now, that is a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of an, an, an anomalous statement, but the reality is if you look back to Trinidad then and what happened, let's just go the first 20 years after after independence. We had essentially a political hegemony. You had, as I said on a, on a TV show recently, a ship that came out of the harbor. At that time, you wanted one captain. Um, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, on surety with regards to, to people. So you needed to have a, what we call maximum leader. So for 20 years until the death, it's about 19 years of, of, of Dr. Eric Williams, there was that one leader, right? But when you look at simple things such as the, the nomenclature and the names of the cities and the towns and the boroughs in Trinidad and Tobago, they were never changed. Trinidad, and one of the, the, the best voices on this, obviously, was Naipaul. Trinidad was always seen as a stepping stone, nothing more than that, to, to El Dorado. It's almost as if people came on their way to this search for gold. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, you know, pre-1962, of course. And mm -hmm. you think of now, all the names in Trinidad, nothing was ever changed, right? I mean, Oropoon, Oropush, uh, Tamana. Uh, Blanchichez, Barakpo, all of these, a lot of these names were all Amerindian names that the English never even bothered changing, as opposed to Tobago, where you see Mason's Hall and Scarborough and so on. There was, you know, there was a lot more seen about Trinidad and Tobago, the expectations. So from that perspective, we never really developed as a society. Politically, we never developed. And the most scarring thing has been this, uh, you know, this winner takes all perspective when it came to the politics, where you almost held on to political power for, for their life. What made that worse, what really was the lack of, a, of an engaged and, dare I say, educated um, society. Now, 
you can, you know, as Plato said, educating your mind without your heart is not educating yourself at all. So it's very easy to become book smart, and we have tremendous, you know, educated people in Trinidad. But as a society, we never developed. This segued into the 80s, where our first oil boom came along. And when you consider the first oil boom of the 80s, which I was a, obviously a very young man then, very, very young, given my age, um, you know, we didn't learn much from it. It became this kind of hyper, the country went to hyper development, right? There was never any real set of planning through that boom. There was tremendous corruption. And uh, it, my understanding now is that we talk about from my generation, you had the 2010 and 2015. Um, UNC, which was, um, as somebody told me, corruption on steroids. Because what happened with that was <laughs> the corruption, the corruption really reached from the lowest levels right all the way up to cabinet. Whereas before, there was some insulation where the corruption really happened, um, you know, at, at some institutional levels. But apart from that, I understand in the mid 80s, the, the opulence and the decadence that happened was very small part of the society was 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 ever so grand and it continued into the 90s and we continued to not develop our societies there's there was no infrastructural development when you consider the type of money that passed through Trinidad and Tobago and let's just use the last 30 years for example from the first oil boom to now the simple question is are we better off now than we were then and the simple answer is no but when you think about things such as the immaturity of the society in 1976, which is fair enough, there was a boycott. And if you recall um, the no vote campaign where the then opposition, I believe it was a DLP, um, boycotted the election. So the PNM won the election outright. There was, you know, and from a protest perspective, that's fine. You know, if you're gonna have that protest and see it through. So that protest happened. The PNM wins the election the then PNM, of course, uh, with no opposition. And that's when the, the 1976 Constitution of Trent Tobago was written. That is the very same Constitution that governs us today, 35 years later. So mm -hmm. you had a Constitution, which is a document designed to protect citizens from too much government. And I have asked businessmen, societal leaders of all shapes and sizes, what a Constitution is. And five out of ten of them don't know. They think it's how you run the country, the laws of the country. So you had a document like the Constitution that was designed that, in and of itself, is designed to protect citizens from too much government. That was written by a government with absolutely no opposition. And mm. 35 years hence, that's the 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 Constitution that still governs us today. So when you think about those dysfunctions, right? And then you have to ask yourself, how could we have built a society, built a country that is progressive and forward thinking when we have a constitution that not just needs tremendous reform, but from where it was born out of um, was really antithetical to what a constitution is. And you ask yourself why we, do, we face the problems that we have now. Um, you know, I, think it's, I think it's easy to see. And then, of course, the inability, the, the most difficult thing for a country or a human being to cope with is success. And we had copious, copious amounts of money. Yeah, um, and we, 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 we misspent, squandered, wasted, pilfered, and of course, um, stole a lion's share of it. So by extension, the society was never given the opportunity to, um, to be really where we should be today. So those are just a couple of the things that, that put us where we are. I mean, we can go in later to some more of the, um, the micro issues. But from right. an umbrella perspective, that's, that's really where I see it. No, and I, I appreciate that you set that context because what you really are talking about is what we see um, in, in all Caribbean societies. You have either settler colonies <clears throat> or you have extractive colonies when we had colonization, right? And you would find that the countries that were extractive colonies like Trinidad and Tobago, well, okay, not Tobago, Trinidad, like Guyana, yeah, Trinidad. like Suriname, for example, you're right. It was not set up in a way 
to stay. We were set up in a way that we extract, we take, we rape, we plunder, and we leave. And so your, your point to me can all be um, seen through that lens of the type of colony we were in the beginning. And that has left us with all kinds of, not just constitutional, but legal and cultural frameworks that then continue to support that kind of rentier and extractive state that we have. Yeah, but if I could just add too, also yeah. to add to that, spiritual and philosophical, because exactly. it, I think it was Capaldeo that said we're a, na we're a nation of migrants. I mean, yes. our, what we aspire to is to go to Miami or to America, that's yeah. The, that, that's the aspiration. So <laughs> he said it 30 years ago that we were a nation of migrants. It mm -hmm. was even, even from the perspective of not just the guys who came and extracted and said, you know, we're going to stop off here. And if you read some of Nightfall, they're ready to stop along. There were a couple of brothels, have a few drinks, have a good time, go to find your gold and then head back home. But it also right. let that mindset come upon us where exactly. there really, it, there's a lack of nationalism in Trinidad. I mean, you paint your face red, white, and black <coughs> when the Warriors are playing football. Um, but the reality is whether we win or whether we lose, there's a street party after. And that's what our culture has become. Now, that's a good thing in some regards because when those two plates are rubbing against each other, normally you get sparks. But in Trinidad, there's been, I mean, short of what happened in 1990, there's been a remarkable ability for the country to not, those sparks not to emanate, you know. So it, 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 it played into our psyche as well, that extractive perspective. I agree. It's a mentality and a culture that we do have, and philo philosophically, that's what's driving it. I completely agree with you. Let me switch now to John. You've been sitting very patiently and listening to everything. Um, and I want to hear what is your take based on what you observed, of course, as a child <coughs> living in Trinidad and Tobago when you came back, uh, when you were ambassador, and since then, observing what's happening in Trinidad. What, what is your sense of what the problems are and how we got here? My sense uh, as a child before leaving at 14, very innocent, very innocent country. Uh, people looked out for each other. Uh, I remember police not carrying guns. They rarely saw police with a gun. So communities, uh, <clears throat> villages, they, they took care of each other. I fast forward, I came back 40 something years later, and it's a country that's riddled with crime. And uh, the crime situation is not new, and it affects all segments of society. It affects business. It affects uh, education. It affects everything, mm -hmm. uh, the economy. Uh, so what I saw, again, and from all my briefings as I studied the country, I had only came back maybe once or twice after leaving <clears throat> the age of 14. And uh, getting a better understanding, um, the corruption, widespread. The corruption was there before Venezuela. I know a lot of, a lot of people like to say Venezuela is probably the catalyst for it. It's, it's, it has been there for, for years. Yeah. Um, now, the Venezuela situation obviously is not helping now. So I credit, I would say, the, uh, the crackdown on the war on drugs in Mexico, Colombia, it has been fairly efficient, not completely, and that has driven uh, the, the bad guys, the drug trade it has driven and has put a lot of pressure on TNT, a country that's too small, does not have the resources to handle all these bandits and uh, the drugs and stuff that's coming through the country. It's a transit point. They're, like I say, it's a transition point. TNT is not known as a user. So all that right. money, that, that foreign money, uh, again, which it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's fueled by the drug trade. It's, uh, it's affecting every segment of society. It's affecting the, 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 the law enforcement. It's, it's, gonna, it's affecting the military. I'm seeing military folks are getting arrested for doing some of the same stuff that... Uh, and and uh, police. And police. Police, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that is what I have seen. I have not seen the will uh, the politicians continue to talk, but we need to do this. But I have not seen the will to make those bold, tough decisions 
and, and, and address the issue. So both uh, parties in power, I think there is, there is a need for young, new, bold, innovative leaders. And, and, and instead of the same recycled uh, politicians uh, to come back and do the same thing they have done maybe four or five years ago, they come back again. So there's a need for, for alternative for the people. So to me, crime is the driving force of a lot of the issues that TNT is facing because the crime cause is, is, it derives from corruption. Yes, because corruption is white collar crime, right? Yep. It's just not yep. violent crime. It's, and, yep. and it's a manifestation of institutional weakness, weakness in the police um, force, a weakness in the judiciary, um, yep. basically weaknesses across the board in terms of the institutions that we have in Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the things that I always lament is the fact that we have a culture of impunity in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, so many people get away with all kinds of crimes and I'm not just talking about violent crimes, even the white collar crime, or maybe especially the white collar crime. Yes. Uh, and I keep saying, you know, when was the last time somebody was convicted of corruption in Trinidad and Tobago? Um, it's, when I was a child, I remember there was a case of a judge who went to jail uh, for taking a bribe. But since then, I could scarcely recall um, cases of people being convicted of corruption in Trinidad. And, and we know that it's there. So it's not that, that it's scarce or rare. Um, and that goes back to the institutional uh, strength but also the mentality because we continue to accept it right uh and you you are right john i think in saying that neither of the current government or the previous government successive governments have not really addressed these issues and i agree with you that we need new blood so and mm -hmm, yes Go ahead. i went back and looked at crime for the past 10 years Mm -hmm. I did. I did some research. It just mm -hmm. continue. It continues to get worse. <laughs> yeah. It's just um, TNT oh. is ranked like six on the crime index world worldwide. Six. Right. We had our we had our right. highest homicide rate in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the last two years, 2018 and 2019, those two years have come very close to the 2008 level. So we had a dip for a while, and then we're right back up again. Yep. Now. I want to then switch back to Peter to talk about, because we have some context now of what, what the, the problems are and how, and how it came about um, from domestic um, conditions as well as external conditions. Give us your thoughts on what are some of the solutions, please. Well, um, we, we spoke briefly there about um, about the increases in crime over the last 10 years. And there's also a, probably a concomitant increase in the perceptions of the levels of corruption, right? In Trinidad. If not, I mean, if there's, I mean, there's no way to gauge corruption outside of, I think, um, I think in, in either in Terence Farrell's book or Motley's book said, I think it was Motley's book, Industry and, um, Industry and Politics, it said, Credit Suisse estimated 30% of our budget is lost to squander and, and waste. So, but there's no other way to gauge it, right? There, well, you just... if, I, if I might interrupt you, there was a study done by uh, Dabla Norris, who's, I believe is at the IMF, and he found that 75% of public investment in Trinidad and Tobago is unproductive. Right, 75%. That's yeah. correct. Oh, oh. That's what this empirical oh. study found. And the second thing I will say to you around how do we possibly measure corruption is, which I've talked about many times, is this thing called the errors and omissions item on the balance of payments that really measures the outflow of foreign currency, because it's a net negative figure, the net outflow of foreign currency that cannot be accounted for through the banking system or any other measure of accounting that the central bank uses. And that errors and omissions item was negligible up until 2013. 
Like and then it just exploded, okay? And to the point where it's around 2% of GDP and the IMF has flagged it as one of the highest in the world. And so I would suggest to you that those two measures give us a sense of how much corruption and squander there right. is. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt you yeah. now, you go ahead. No, no, right, and the point is, Corruption is a scourge. It's a scourge wow. that fuels crime, right? There is nothing more heinous in a society than political and, and, and economic corruption, right? right. Uh, stealing from the coffers of the state, right? It, it, corruption's real cost is not just the money. It, you know, I tweeted about this. It stifles innovation and creativity. It, 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 it drains trust in the system. Right, and it, it, it takes people's it, it attacks people's will uh, from 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 doing what is right. Right, it destroys society's will to do what's right because it attacks a system of fairness. And what is up happening? Right. So, is, what you know, what, are, what what are your ideas around how do we solve this? I mean, we know that corruption is really, really at the core of in terms of the institutional weakness core manifestation of that and it's a real problem and it per, it's pervasive what are your thoughts around these solutions not just for corruption but the ease of doing business that it then affects and that other things affect crime also affects ease of doing business. tell us your yeah. thoughts on these solutions yeah. well the point is the first thing we have to consider is that you have the most important part the most critical component of of a, of a democracy right are not politicians and not even institutions, the citizens. Um, you, we need to have a re-engaged population, right? Now, what has happened in the last 15 years in particular, and that's where we have fallen down, is that at the end of the day, everybody was too caught up making money, and nobody really cares. So right now, you have all these armchair commentators getting involved now and say what needs to be done or what does not need to be done. I think the most recent one, I think I, I, I sent a tweet out, the former um, uh, head of the Chamber of Commerce in Trinidad spoke about the need for procurement legislation, right? But when you were the head of the Chamber and procure, procurement legislation requirements didn't happen yesterday, it, needs to, it, it should have happened 25 years ago, right? Uh, so all of these guys now, but we sat there at the time, and we've we've made the politics into. I mean, again, as somebody said, we are so lacking in self-esteem in Trinidad that our politicians become our movie stars. A parliament is our Oscars. So, and I, you know, as an owner of several restaurants throughout the Caribbean, I, I've seen the politicians come in to the restaurants, and I've seen bona fide stars, bona fide local people who have accomplished so much more, whether an old cricketer who represented, you know, the West Indies. And when the politicians come in, everyone's looking starry-eyed and saying, look, there's Peter or there's Marla. Wow. And then the, the bona fide celebrity who's done so much more kind of get elbowed aside and say, you know, I want to get up there. So it's that recognition that of that maturing as a society that has not begun to happen. When that begins to happen, and we begin to recognize how much the opportunity inequality and the political polarization that's being um, um, propagated on a daily basis by both parties, right? Um, we begin to realize the effect that's having. And we begin to, as John suggested, recognize, and you, and you may have read my last letter to the editor, uh, which they published. And I, I said, did. Yeah, uh, it's victory is within our grasp, but it's we who have to recognize that, you know, but it's this myth, it's this myth that it's a two-party state and anybody else who decides to, to, to you know, to make, a, to make a move is wasting their time and you actually frighten people. It's a myth. It's a myth to keep good people out. So once we can have a society, and if you look back at what happened in Colombia not too long ago, they got fed up. And the, the, the point of my column... So what happened? And what do we need to happen in Trinidad and Tobago? That's what I want to ask you. Well, well, no, the point is, the tipping point is here. What happened in Colombia right. is they got to the tipping point. They got to, right. and, they, and they got fed up. I mean, there were judges in Colombia who literally left they literally mm -hmm. left on a plane, left assets and stuff, and they just fled, 
right, to, to get away from it. I mean, th that's how radical that it was. Now, do we have to be that radical? I don't know. I don't know. But we need to realize now that the, the cause of our problem is government. They cannot be the solution to our problem, right? And it may not necessarily be either one of these two parties, but it's a system of governance that stems from the fact that we still have an archaic constitution that is not pliant to the type of society that we have today. But more than that, we have a population that is disengaged, that um, like to hear the rants of these political personalities, um, like to get around a table at a, a rum shop and say, boy, things are bad, you know, you know, it's troubled by this side and troubled by that side, what are we going to do yet when the time comes for them to make a change? They don't do it. So right. I think so we so so we need constitutional reform. We know that. And to get constitutional reform, you need a special majority. And we know that, as you just said, the two sides that brought us here, uh, we can't look to them for the solution. They don't have their bereft of solutions, right? So right. how do we get a society? How do we you know, I, I have been told that you are right, Colombia hit rock bottom and they Colombia, uh, the U.S. worked work behind the scenes to support Colombia. Oh, of course. Huge, huge. And uh, I had Marines down there in Colombia for many, many years, helping their, their military uh, and the police get their stuff together. Long, long many years. Okay. Like I had, yep. And I had met with my counterpart from Colombia uh, a couple of times also. So then, I, John, I like that you jumped in there to discuss that. Um, I like that you that you suggested, you know, how bilateral um, assistance from other countries can help us to transcend the challenges that we have. Short term challenges in terms of crime, for example, but then we have longer term challenges in yes. constitutional reform and other institutional reforms that we need in Trinidad and Tobago. Tell so, us. Right. So, so, so some of the solutions, again, first of all, government could only do so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Government has to be also open for people on the outside from the communities that, that understands the problem firsthand. So uh, I think government needs to continue to work aggressively and with a sense of urgency uh, with their chief allies, the international allies with Trinidad and Tobago. The bottom line is that's the U.S. and Great Britain. They should right. also look to, to look to help, look for help from Colombia. How did Colombia do this? How did it? Exactly. They should look for help from Colombia, and they should also look at Mexico. Mexico has a huge problem, but they have been making inroads into it. Uh, I think they should look, from my perspective especially Colombia again, and, and work closely with their chief allies, the U.S. and the British. You don't want to work with too many people. If, uh, you bring too many to the table, it just gets all convoluted, and, and everyone thinks their system is better than the other one. Right. Um, they, they need to get involved working with the allies. The, the state-of-the-art technology, technology innovation is going to play a big part of it. Uh, one of the things uh, people seem to, to think is that just because you're older, you're supposed to be wi wiser, you're more mature, you have all the answers and, and the solutions. That's not necessarily so. I, I will use an example, just an example. I like to go back because, again, my whole adult life was spent in the military. Mm -hmm. We were getting our butts handed to us early on in, in, the, in the invasion of Iraq. Yes, we were. We, we, we had prepared for this war for a long time, and it, they were, it was causing us some problems. Mm -hmm. What did we do? The old generals and the colonels and the old sergeants majors, they didn't have all the answers. The wars and stuff they fought <laughs> decades ago. Mm -hmm. What we had to do was put our pride aside, bring in the young leaders, the young sergeants, the lance corporals, the corporals. We brought them back from, from the battlefield. We brought them back took them off the battlefield, come on back to uh, Washington, D.C., Quantico, and we big conference forums, 
tell us what we need to do to win this war, to be effective. So we, again, we, we deferred. We didn't have all the answers. Politicians, the older politicians, and I used to say, I didn't have all the answers either. I don't. Right. <laughs> so you got to be open to do that. And so in order for the government to be effective in governing, they must reach out to the communities right. and let the communities participate in these forums from all segments of society, right. the bad side, the good side, those in between, you bring them together. And then you can understand why this, why this gangster it, uh, feels being a gangster, why is he doing it? He or she doing it? Right. Uh, yeah, you bring them all to the table. Police needs to be part of that process. Everyone needs to be part of that process. The religious leaders, you start doing that across the country. Somebody needs to take that and run with it. Bring folks together and address these issues. And you may find out some of these folks that sitting around the table, some people refer to, uh, may refer to them as uneducated, derelicts or whatever, they might have their solution. So in other words, we don't even know the solutions. We need to involve all the stakeholders to yes. come together and tell us what their thoughts are on what mm. the solutions are. I, yes. Yeah, I actually think that you're onto something there because, yeah, when you ask when you ask the policymakers for solutions, no, you don't get a lot of credible right. answers. They and talk more, a lot about. Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Peter. Two two things to what John said because it's segue nice yes. about what I was speaking about. One, yeah. the seniors. Seniors in the army recognize the importance, right, of looking inward and saying, "Listen, we may whether it was the, whether it was the guys in the Pentagon or the guys on the battlefield that said, listen, let's call these guys back in because clearly the strategy is not working.' There's a certain level of confidence and self stability to be able to do that. Our polit political class doesn't have that. That's what's <laughs> up. That. They don't. They will sit there and chip away at the ice block with a dull ice pick for years because the, 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 in war, there's a lot at stake. But here, there's a lot at stake for them by doing that. There's a concentration of power to the point where that's what it is. It's about not being able to let go. And one of the critical problems that we have had is that that disconnect between the political class or the leadership class and the population is there. So when they couldn't, they couldn't get they couldn't get across a message to us, what ended up happening was they started going and speaking to the gang leaders and and the, the criminal elements, as we saw with Patrick Manning in 2006, 2007, to drive their political fortunes that way. They canvassed the vote, they got people out, these community leaders. But we have to have the, the, the will, and that's what you know, basic phrase. Statesmen think about the next generation. Politicians think about the next election. What mm -hmm. are we going to do? Those guys on the battlefield who John was, uh, was there with recognized, listen, we need to make changes to ensure the continuity of what we believe in. And they had the ability to do that. We, uh, the problem with us is we don't have it. And as citizens, we don't demand it. We have the people here. We have the Lance Corporals. We have the private first classes. We have those guys in Trinidad. Yeah. But for whatever reason, they are being, uh, they, they looked at askance. Guys like myself, and I'm not saying I'm the solution, but somebody who gets up and says, listen, I'm going to draw a line in the sand. This is not working. Yeah. You're portrayed as, as a nuisance. You're portrayed as, and then you get sidelined. And quite frankly, um, you're not listened to. We need to have the leadership from that perspective. Say, so listen, exactly. I am going to, look at the, was it the Queen of Belgium? At 62, she abdicated. She basically said, I don't have what it takes to run this country. I passed the throne to my 34-year-old son. Right? That's what the guys in Iraq did. And that's 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 the difference. We don't have that here. But but also to what John said, we have to geopolitics, basic understanding. We have to understand America is our strongest ally. There was a time. There was a time when John and I had discussed this privately before. There was a, you think there could have been a headline in the papers saying Jamaica is America's strongest ally? You think there could have been a presidential meeting, whether it's Mar-a-Lago or Kenny Bunkport, or wherever it is, and the prime minister of, of top 
Caribbean leaders and we are not there? I mean, it's remarkable. We look to the left and we see Maduro. We look to the right and we see the, the, the United States and we pick Maduro. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it, it's just mind-bogglingly stupid, irrespective of how you feel as an individual. We look to the left, look to the right, we, we pick Venezuela. It's, I mean, it's remarkably I, think, I don't think it's so mind-boggling, Peter, if you look at it through the lens of corruption, because clearly looking to the left and embracing Maduro has a lot to do with the, resor the, the, the resources that we share and the fact that there's easy money flowing out of that regime via Petrocaribe or otherwise. Um, and perhaps that is where the motivation lies for, for going that way. But John, you are you itching to say something? Let's hear. <laughs> no. So <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at solutions here. So I, I mm -hmm. gave you uh, uh, my opening uh, statement on solution, community involvement. You need, you need mm -hmm. good, confident, young leadership. Uh, the com I want to go on to the commissioner of police. I've been watching ever since. I read the news daily, I get the news report. I had hoped that the commissioner of police uh, would be more successful. I was a big advocate of, uh, of uh, Commissioner Griffin going into that position. I was, even before I left TNT. He needed a change. But I must say, I am a little disappointed at his approach to fighting crime. So part of the solution here, I, fe I feel he has done more to antagonize uh, the criminal element with his bravado, Rambo uh, style, um, and, and the, the threats that I see that he puts out, uh, uh, I, I think that's ineffective. It's totally ineffective. Uh, I don't think the country needs a, 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 a commission of police that runs around with a big gun on his side and, and, and camouflage uh, fatigues and such, like he is, he's in the army. He, he's, he's a commissioner of police for the whole country. I think he could be as just, well, he's not been effective right now. So I'm not gonna say that he could be as effective. He has not been effective. The, the statistics shows it. But he could be more effective by being quiet, by being humble, and work from behind the scenes to influence what happens. So if he continues on this trend again, he's building himself up as, again, Rocky Balboa or, or, or The Rock or something like that. And all that does is tell the gangsters, I'm coming after you. And they're gonna say, okay, come on after us. We're gonna take you on. Instead of looking for a way to, to, to try to communicate, collaborate. Uh, uh, so, his, his focus should be more on his police force as a solution, more on his police force working in those communities, all communities across the country, all of them, building relationships in those communities. That's what they should be doing. And he should have zero, zero tolerance for corruption within the police force, zero. Right. You, 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 you take a bribe, you rob someone, you are out, and you go to jail. Zero tolerance. Uh, that's what should be happening. Um, the focus, again, should be less on his, his inflammatory rhetoric. Again, it's totally it's counterproductive. Uh, the forums and roundtables, as I suggest, with the communities across the country, with, again, religious leaders, police, uh, government officials at all levels, the high level, the low level, get them around the table and discuss, hey, we have these problems, the business leaders, bring them together and you probably will find solutions and get some better results by again, having everyone involved. Uh, it's gonna take, again, strong leadership to do it. It has to come from the top. And if the leadership from the top does not have it, it's gonna be hard to happen, but then the people need to demand it. And how do you get the people? Yeah. How do you get the people to demand it? I Gotta agree. Some, I know, yeah, you, uh, you know what I really like about that is that Trinidad is a low trust society, and I feel like if any of us were to come unilaterally, even the commissioner of police, with with this is what I think the solution is. It's less likely to be adopted by or 
it's less likely to be considered credible. Mm -hmm. If it is, however, arrived at by a consensus and by a dialogue. Yes. And, yeah. I call it everyone buying into this problem. If everyone buys into the solution, you got to have buy-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, again, if you have, again, you just mentioned the commissioner or, or some politicians said this is how it's going to be, folks don't trust you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, the problem, John, the problem, John, as a, what is a country? You become just a collection of self interests. Yeah. It's very hard to have buy in. And I mean, I don't want to sound negative, but we, that's what we've become. We've, we've become a country, a collection of self interests, whether from the chambers to the various institutions, it's all self interest. So you're not, you have to have, there needs to be one unifying, and you know, uh, the, the politics of personality has played out so much in Trinidad, but whether it's one person, or whether it's one movement, or one ideology, right? Um, something has to, to, to gel us together. Um, and, yep. Yeah, and, and they I mean, need that one person, they need that yeah. one person to fire yeah. up and motivate people to yeah. do this. Yeah. Probably, probably and it's, one it's possible. Person. It's possible. Yeah, the problem with the one person is <laughs> megalomaniacs. And the commissioner of police is, I mean, he's an associate of mine for many, many years. But what we do is we create megalomaniacs. We create mega personalities. And as I put in my recent column, we need brains, not bullets. I mean, <laughs> blood begets more blood. We need, the yep. country needs thinking. We have to, you know, think of, starve the demand for crime. Don't fight. When you have young guys who've grown up saying, you know, if they make it to 25 years old, that's a life well lived. So they don't, I mean, when you go and say, I'm going to root out the cockroaches or everything else, no, I understand what you're trying to do from the perspective, but those guys, those guys don't really care. They don't. They've been forgotten, yeah, they've been forgotten as, 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 a, as, as a person already. They don't care. As you very well know, we had that same, we had that same issue. It, it has subsided in the U.S., but we had them in Chicago. We had it in New York, Los Angeles. They don't care. They get to 25, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. So you, are to, you, you, you want to fight them with uh, inflammatory rhetoric and talk and, 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 and big guns? And if I make it to 25, that's, that's 75 for most so, people. I live. But so, so, okay, we're saying that, you know, what we really need, is, what I'm hearing is that what we really need is a shift in the politics where we have somebody that we believe is not motivated by self-interest. It's motivated Correct. by what well, is best. Self-serving. Yep, self-serving. Right. And <laughs> can bring everybody together, all the stakeholders, to discuss solutions and arrive at a consensus around solutions, right? Yep. I am... Look at nice white paper. That's a nice <laughs> white paper indeed, but who's going to read it? The yeah. point, the problem though, and I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm defeated. I think there is always hope, but I don't see either the UNC or the PNM representing that unifying force, representing that sh complete shift. Um, and the, beyond that, I mean, we know the kinds of challenges we've had historically in Trinidad and Tobago with a third party. Now we have the Now Movement. We have, you know, a few of them. Um, coming around and, and you know, waving their, th throwing their hat in the ring, basically, for the election that will happen you know, later this year. What are your thoughts, both of you, on do any of these represent that kind of change that we would like to see in, in, in the political sphere? Do any of them have this kind of consensus building outreach on their agenda? My sense is not really um I and i think that they might dilute but i don't know that any of them could i i don't know that i can see any of them winning outright what, what do i i mala i agree with with your assessment on that what mm -hmm. the country needs again and i'm saying this doesn't mean i'm endorsing bernie sanders he's a very special individual here that man 70 something years old full of energy he has started a huge movement. He may be caucusing with one party, but if you look at it, he's not truly a Democrat, <laughs> but he has caused a wave of excitement with young folks, mostly young folks, and, and some, I mean, the folks 65 and over are not embracing him too much, but he has, again, he has started a movement. 
you need a, an individual like that at TNT yeah. that could inspire and motivate people to, to a cause like that. I think it's it's possible, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I I I don't I don't see that leader out there yet. Maybe maybe they will surface in the next few years. Well, John, to augment to you, Bernie also has a central message, right? I mean, it's I mean, yes. the point is he's he's a messenger as well, and yes. as you know, as he flails his hands and stuff, but he's charismatic. Yes. Yes. And, and it's, it's remarkable how you have 21-year-old uh, super liberal school girls, uh, uh, just when I say college girls, that are completely attached to this 78-year-old guy mm -hmm. in the last decade of his life, mm -hmm. right? So the messenger is good, but there's also a central message behind it. So I, I think in Trinidad, to answer, and I disagree with you a bit, and my column indicated basically that victory is within our grasp. But it needs to be it needs to be a message that's different. Yes. And it needs to be messengers that are different. But there needs to be something that people could actually say, you know what? I don't think I don't think there's any one thing or one person that can corral everybody. But I believe it's possible that there is uh, there is an individual or group of individuals or hundreds, I mean, that can get people behind them and get others to say, you know what? I'm not a hundred percent in. But I like where you're going, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm prepared to take that walk with you, right? Yep. There's too much absolutism in our politics here. The yeah. two parties, the two parties, make it clear: either you're with us or you're against us. You know, you're yes. you know, PNM till a, PNM till are dead, and or, or PNM UNC fanatics. They make it that way. It's that polarization is by design, and then they make it out to be that you tell people, boy, you can't vote for somebody else because you're going to split the vote. But, so what you're basically saying is the one thing I my franchise, which is yes. the only thing, and I think yes. who who was it that said it? I think it was Michael Moore when he was speaking about Trump. He said it's the one time of life that Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and Joe Blow is We're all equal. equal. It's the mm -hmm. one time. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what you're basically saying is that one thing that makes me an individual, right? Don't exercise it the way you want to exercise it because you may out, you may affect an outcome that, no, people have to exercise their franchise. There should be 10 parties in Trinidad, right, with different groupings. The Green Party has 40,000. The, the Progressive have 100,000. The PNM has 300,000. Maybe they form a government with a minority, but begin to evolve society away from this red and True. yellow baloney. And if that happens, and that was the crux of my letter. If that happens, we have a chance. Victory is within our grasp. And I think we have, somebody said, find 41 people now for the 41 parliaments. I said, well, find 41,000. 95% of this country are good people. They're good, mm -hmm. productive, industrious, church-going, spiritual, believing, loving family people. That's mm -hmm. what we are. But the mm -hmm. problem is the bulk of our leadership class fall into the 5%. Right, and that's what the problem is. And I don't mean they're they're immoral, but they're in that um, that cadre of people that are self-serving, and they look insiders upon the and outsiders. Yeah, insiders yeah, that's and exactly outsiders. Yeah, insiders and outsiders. And they look they look at the outsiders as just minions, right? They're mm -hmm. just pawns, and nothing more glaring. Every five years, for thirty-five days, campaigning starts, and they're in the constituencies. They pave the roads, and the day after the election. You don't see them for four years and 11 months. And it happens cycle after cycle after yeah, cycle. It does. So unless we wake up, we as a society wakes up, we're going to get more of this. We're going to be force-fed this again and again and again. But the question is, at what point does the country revolt? Right. I, I, I believe, Peter, there's, there's that charismatic leader there in Trinidad and Tobago somewhere that will surface here probably within the next few years. If things continue the way it is, I hope it's not too late. It, and it's got to be again somebody that's charismatic, that's going to be able to to feel the people, the, the issues, and comes across as very sincere. And it will have to be a new leader, again, not yeah. the old recycled ones all the time. I agree. I really hope that whoever that person is and whoever that brave soul is um, will show themselves sooner rather than later. <laughs> Um, you might you might have somebody like a Bernie, a little seventy something year old person decides with the energy to come out and do it. 
<laughs> Listen, any port for a storm now. I mean, the point is, any port for a storm. I mean, uh, we we need. Uh, I mean, the country needs a directional healing. Uh, because yeah. we just go down the wrong road, and it's it's clear that we're going down the wrong road. And I think even the leaders know we're going down the wrong road, but they don't have any solutions. They don't well, have solutions within themselves. To they offer. don't have these <clears throat> solutions, but they're self-serving. So they might recognize that this is the wrong road. So what they do is they hedge, and they park their money outside, and they have their assets outside. And so when you know the proverbial shit hit the fan, they, they're gone, you know? I mean, we really need people who are for country. Um, and we need to get away from the rum and roti politics and the short-termism. Uh, and I feel like that really is a shift that we that has to happen in our heads. I feel, I see it in the young people that they are so um, disconnected from these things. Um, you know, it's it's almost abstract to some of them. That They've I've lost hope. They've lost hope. They've lost hope. Yep, they've been hearing the same uh, old things, and they have gotten apathetic. Yeah, yeah. But apathy is, you know, listen. I tell it all the time. Apathy is a far more dangerous characteristic mm -hmm. than anger. You know, my dad told me all the time. You know, when I uh, I write these columns and so on, he says, "You're always angry. You're always angry. You're always, you, you, you know, against this and against that, against the other." And I told him, I said, "I said, anger is a good emotion." Because anger creates, it gets you out of stasis. Apathy is stasis. People just don't care. When you don't care, Mala, John, when as a country you don't care, you literally disconnect and say, you know what? I'm going to silo myself and just look after myself. You become self-interested. And it becomes 1.4 mm -hmm. million people of individuals saying, you know what? I look after myself. Whatever happened to them, I don't care. And that's yeah. when a society begins to break down. And that's the discussion that we have to start having. Yeah, but we have to channel this anger, though, in a in a solutions oriented manner, as opposed to anger that is not constructive. And I feel like, as I have that too, um, and so which is why I do these webinars, why I write, and you write as well, Peter. And you know, it's important for us to channel it in a way that that is constructive and solutions oriented. Um, now, so we need to wrap up because we're on an hour. I just would like each of you to give me your your closing remarks um and uh, and then and then we'll say goodbye peter you want to go first <clears throat> yeah i mean just just very briefly we got we didn't get to touch on solutions too much um but i think and i know i mentioned you know in passing we need to and i don't mean make an effort or we need to eliminate political and economic corruption it needs to stop Mm -hmm. right? You need to make an effort to eradicate it completely so that you can have a more, you can begin to have a cohesive society, a society based on merit, a society based on opportunity, right? I've said it before, income inequality is a natural state of the free market, right? I have more money than you, you have more money than John, John has more money than Mike, that's, that's clear, right? But opportunity inequality stifles a country. When someone does not have the opportunity Right, and our society is not predicated on opportunity. That's why America is the greatest nation in the history of mankind. Because if you want to become a billionaire, you have the opportunity. It may not happen. It doesn't give it. America doesn't say you're gonna be a millionaire, but you have the opportunity. Right? If you want to be a nine to five person, listen. At five p.m., Fred Flintstone pulls the horn, and I go home. I don't want to be bothered on Monday morning at nine a.m. There's room for that as well. There's no opportunity in Trinidad. We have to create opportunity equality. We have to eradicate corruption. And we have to focus heavily, heavily on the two things, education and family, right? The, 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 the backbone of successful societies, family. Um, we, have, we have almost um, made um, family taboo from the perspective, certainly, maybe not now, and, Church speaks out stuff in the last 10 or 15 years. And if we begin to address opportunity inequality, start the demand for crime, let people realize, you know what? If I put in eight, nine hours of hard work, I may get to manager. I may then get to general manager. I may then become an executive or the CEO, whatever the case may be, and there's an opportunity for me. You will start to begin seeing people, um, you know, do the right thing. And you have to get our leaders, as John said, Get away from the sound bites and the rhetoric and, and you know we need brains we need critical thinking we need dialogue we need solutions um not just um 
not just empty empty political talk. I mean, the country is just sick and tired of it. It's to the point where they're now discredited. They're actually making a mockery of what politics is meant to be, which is the ultimate um, the ultimate form of Agreed. Thank you. John, you want to give yeah. us your, your closing thoughts? Peter, well said. Uh, you, you touched on a, a couple of things I was going to touch on. I appreciate it. Creating opportunity uh, to address the income inequality. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in the US, uh, one of the greatest nations in the world, if you work hard, anything is just about possible. <laughs> I like to touch on Michael Bloomberg. He made his money his own. It wasn't handed to him. 68 point yeah. something billion dollars. He made it. His family didn't give it to him. So anything is possible. I, I, I think if you uh, if you work at it, I, I think the majority of the people in the country, like you said, are good people. You got uh, uh, um, probably about a good ninety something percent are really really good people. The, yeah. the, 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 the rest of them, the rest the rest that are behaving badly, um, you probably could get probably half of them to behave a little better if they had opportunities. Uh, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, the economy is not well, so you have a lot of folks that are left out. If they are left out, they are, they're, they're trying to survive. It comes down to survival, some of them, and they're going to do bad things to, uh, for survival. You know, need food, on the, uh, food on, the, on the table for their families, for them, or whatever. Be, uh, again, and you also have some that really, regardless of what opportunities they have, they're going to continue to be bad. And you've yeah, got, you yeah. got, you got to deal with them. You got to have a, 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 a good criminal justice reform, and you got to hold people accountable for those, again, 2.5% or whatever that will continue to be bad. You have to deal with them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the corruption, I, I don't see it being dealt with as long as you continue along this path with the, with the two parties just switching back and forth. Um, uh, you have to find that, that good leader there in TNT. <laughs> Somebody that's willing, that's, that's willing to step up. And, uh, and I think if you, uh, you continue to write articles like you're writing, that person probably will step up. <laughs> yeah. okay. I don't think uh, trying, if you try to point at me, Marla, is what he's trying to do. Uh, the, the current commissioner of police, I, I again, like all uh, folks from Trinidad and Tobago, high hopes for him. Still hope that he will be successful and be the person that we all thought he could be. Uh, uh, he has failed uh, now, and I hopefully he has learned from that and will re uh, adjust his, uh, his his tactics a little bit, uh, where he would be more more effective. So, thank you for having me. Uh, I always uh, uh, stand by uh, to try to, to help. I will continue to. TNT is in my heart. Uh, as you know, I still have family there. And um, I, I wish the country the best, but I will, I will, I will continue to be involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me. We'll, we'll be calling you. <laughs> Keep your phone closed, John. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, very John. Much. And no, thank, thank you, you, Peter, as well. And thank you both for your time, for your knowledge, for your insights. Um, as you know, uh, this is this is a, a multifaceted problem, and I've usually emphasized talking about the economics. And so this took me a bit outside of my comfort zone, but it's still mm -hmm. very important conversations to have and, and to talk about the the broader problems. I believe we I agree with your perspectives on the solutions. I believe we need massive institutional reform in Trinidad to be able to, to change us from a from an extractive rentier state to a settler, you know, if we want to use that kind of lens, a settler state, settler economy, where we where we not we not leave in, you know, we we're here to stay. Right. And we're here for the long term. And that's what I feel from that and Tobago really sweeping right. deep long term reforms. Um, and you know, I, I'd like to cut in. Mm -hmm. T TNT has had a bad problem for a while with the crime. The Venezuela situation has made it even worse. We have to be real about that. It has yes. made it worse. 
And until that problem is addressed in Venezuela, it will only continue to put huge pressure on Trinidad and Tobago on top of what they already have. That issue with Venezuela must be addressed. Um, the, the influx of, uh, of uh, people looking for a better way of life, um, uh, that's, that's affecting. Ones. Yes, it's, and it's affecting the, the way of life in Trinidad and Tobago, which again, which has, has, has been in a bad situation to begin with. So that, that must be addressed to, to, help, the, uh, to help straighten out the, the issues, challenges in TNT. I agree. I think the influx of people is not necessarily the problem. It's the influx of the weapons and also yes. the fact that that the borders are porous, as you know. Yes, and that's so it. We have no idea what's coming in. The drugs, the weapons, everything that's currency, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and again, that stems from institutional weakness. And so, you know, I will close with my point that I feel like we need the, this, you know, political will to, to really implement institutional reform. Um, and it's going to take a long time, but we can get there with the right leader. Hopefully somebody will put their hand up and, uh, and the rest of us will support. Thank you, gentlemen. And I look forward to engaging with you both in the future again. And, um, and I wish you all the best of luck. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank Good you. to see you guys.